At a quarter to midnight, there were ten women on the corner of Pavon and Santiago del Estero, two sitting on a dark apartment stoop a few feet from where Sylvia was leaning against a tree, one on the corner adjacent to Sylvia, two more across the street, and four in Charlie's bar. Bruno, what do you have to eat back there? a woman asked as she bounded into the bar and kissed three women sitting at tables. All these women, they have a story, said Bruno. Sixty, a wiry, retired factory worker with thinning white hair, a stubbly beard, with eyes that never seem to open fully. He works five nights a week, serving up sausages, dry toast, and coffee so black and hot that Sylvia and the others joke it could raise the dead. They have children, or they have husbands who left them, he said. They do the best they can with what they have. They just don't have much to work with. Ask any one of them if she'd rather have a real job that paid decent money, and she would say yes. Sylvia walked in. She just had a customer, a married man she usually sees once a week. Most customers are married, and it is a running joke among the women how it is a waste of time for wives even to try to keep tabs on their husbands. If they want to cheat, they will cheat. Exhibit A is one regular customer whose wife allows him to leave the house without her for only an hour each day to walk the dog. When the women see him leash in hand, they call for his favorite girl. They lock the dog in the bathroom at Charlie's for 30 minutes, and the two are on their way to the flop house. Fidelity is a dream, Sylvia said as she st stared out the window to the street. A single street lamp gave the darkness a yellowish glow. As she talked, a six-year-old girl walked into the bar, wearing flip-flops and sucking a popsicle. Without saying a word, she kissed Sylvia wetly on the cheek. Sylvia smiled, said hello, and reached into her bra for a few coins to hand the girl. The girl is the daughter of a cartonero who works in the Constitución. She is here every night, Sylvia said, another one of my regulars. Sylvia said she feels a camaraderie with the cartoneros, poor people like her, her whose work is foisted upon them as much as it is, as it is found. In both their business and hers, there is little dignity. She tells almost no one what she does for a living, not even the nanny from Paraguay, who watches her daughter while she works only two blocks away. I'm sure she suspects something, but she doesn't know for sure, and she won't ask, Sylvia said. She feels dirty. She won't so much as touch her daughter without first taking a shower. But showers don't wash everything away. A, a Catholic, Sylvia won't take sacrament in Buenos Aires. She goes to communion only when she is visiting her family in Paraguay. During a visit to Misiones, six months after she turned her first trick, her father asked her how she managed to send home as much as $150 a month, three times what she usually sent home when she was working as a maid. He knew, Sylvia said, but I think he wanted to hear me tell him. Sylvia says she started to leave the room, but then steadied herself, breathed deeply, and blurted out, I sell my body, she told him. Dead silence followed, and for what seemed like forty days, she said, and and to this day she is unsure whether the worst heartache she ever endured was telling her father that she was a prostitute or realizing that he accepted it because it, he knew it was the best she could do. Please, she recalled him telling her, promise me that you will quit the first chance you get. As she tells the story, a man Sylvia recognizes taps on the window pane, summoning her. She tends to him and then another and then another in rapid succession. When she returns to the corner, it is after 5 a.m., and daybreak approaches. She feels most ashamed in the first light of dawn, whether she recounts her head the night's business. Uh, she feels most ashamed in the first light of dawn when she recounts in her head the night's business and her earnings. I hate this life, she says in a barely audible voice as she stands on the corner. I hate it. She stands and then rattles off the phrase again and again, her voice growing louder. I hate it. La odia, la odia, la odia, la odia. She cranes her neck and stares up at the sky for several seconds 
as if wishing on the last star before it evaporates in the light. She sighs and looks down at her feet before saying once more, for good measure, La Odia. Two new women emerge from the shadows and take their places on the corner opposite Sylvia, who sizes them up and announces that it is time to pack it in for the night. She smiles and steps off the corner. Shift change, she says, and heads for home.